a day of celebrating Jesus riding into Jerusalem. It is also our celebration before Holy Week. So I just invite you to come in, bring yourselves into this space, and be open to hearing of the scripture and worshiping God.
Please be seated. This is the last Sunday in the season of Lent. It is known as Palm Sunday. On this day, we remember the time when Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey. People in the crowd greeted him with excitement, waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, which means save us. The donkey and the palm branches remind us of what happened on that first Palm Sunday. Today is also known as Passion Sunday. Passion means deep emotion. Today, we may feel deep emotion as we remember Jesus' suffering and death. On Friday, a few days after Palm Sunday, the crowd turned against Jesus, shouting, Crucify him. In our call to worship this morning, what you see in black, we will say together, and you will also notice that um, on some of the responses, it will say louder or softer, so we will um, go along with that. We join the crowd that eagerly awaited the coming of Jesus. Fulfilling prophecy, Jesus entered the city riding humbly on a donkey. Blessed, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. The crowd was filled with excitement and anticipation, yet within a few short days they were scattered, disillusioned, and frightened, unwilling to commit themselves as far as Christ would have them go. We, too, long to join the triumphal procession, only to find ourselves burdened by the past, fearful of the future, reluctant to accept the way of the cross. Yet this Palm Sunday, we receive palm branches as a reminder of the welcome offered to Jesus as he traveled toward the cross. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Like the crowd in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, we take our palm branches and meet Jesus shouting, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Come, let us worship.
Let us pray together. God of all glory, we come to you today with grateful hearts for all you have done, for all you are doing, and for all you are going to do for us and for those who are yours in this world. We come and shout out our praises with joy. Hosanna! Break out of the box and let loose the most joyous sound of praise. We sing a melody of praise to you, our God. Make music like never before and shout with joyous triumph. Let the ocean's waves join in the chorus with a roaring praise until everyone everywhere joins in unison. Hosanna, glory to you, God. We celebrate knowing that you, God, do all things well. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. He brought a dead man back to life? You saw this for yourself? I did. He had been dead for three days three whole days in the tomb. Then this Jesus comes. He was friends with the man's sisters too. He comes and tells them to open the tomb. They looked at him like he was crazy. We all did. But they opened the tomb and he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And he did. He walked out of the tomb, alive as you and me. It seems not even the grave could contain the power that this Jesus brought with him. The crowd was abuzz with stories about this man who they heard was coming to Jerusalem that day. Those who had seen him before, and many of those who had witnessed the miracles that happened at his hand, were drawn out into the streets to welcome him. And they told their neighbors, their friends, their family, the streets were lined by swells of souls who wanted to catch a glimpse of this Jesus, this... King! I heard he was destined to become our king. Surely he will ride in a magnificent steed, sword by his side, an army behind him. He will save us from the oppressing hand of Rome that is crushing us. He will be our... Prophet. He's a prophet, like Elijah or Daniel, or one of the others. He's here to bring us some divine news. He's here to bring us a message from God. He is... A man. Just a man, flesh and bones, and a whole lot of fanfare over nothing. In fact, I heard he's a Nazarene. Huh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But I know to the religious leaders, he is... A threat, a very real, very dangerous threat, a threat that must finally be answered, and soon. The news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem continued to sweep through the city, and the large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him, and they cheered him, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Most of the crowd spread their branches and garments on the road ahead of him. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting and waving, Hail to the King of Israel! Praise God for the Son of David! And Jesus didn't come on horseback like a conquering king. He rode humbly. 
He rode humbly on the back of a donkey's colt. And he didn't come in an opulent chariot, brandishing a gilded sword. He came with the clothes on his back and the dust on his feet. And behind him, not an army marching in rows by the thousands. He was trailed by a ragamuffin group of fishermen and the poor, the outcasts, and nobodies. Some laid down their palms to praise their king. Some laid down their palms to praise their lord. Soon he would lay down his life for them. Because among the crowd stirred a poison among the people. The religious leaders of the day, in their corrupt, corrupt hearts, a wicked plot was thickening and hardening like stone. Like the whitewashed tombs they were, they would dethrone this king of the Jews, whatever vicious route that must take. Their blood boiled over his constant rebuffing of their evil advances against him. He simply would not go away, and he wouldn't fall into any of their traps. So, since he wouldn't fall, they would have to push him. Since he would not be trapped, they would have to catch him. And bind him and frame him, and blame him, and falsely accuse him, falsely convict him, falsely understand him. And the crowd that shouts Hosanna today, spreading the cloaks off their backs to honor him, breaking palms off trees and waving them at his holy feet, crucify him, will demand the breaking of his body tomorrow. See, this is getting nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. They will resolutely require the laying down of the law upon his innocent head. He threatens our way of life, our position, our pride. The little baby has left the manger to live life like the life he gave us and restore the life that we left in Eden. Our God incarnate King of creation, proven power over death. Power over death? They say he raised a man from the dead? They say he walked right out of the tomb? Well, let's see how he fares when it's his body in the grave and his body in the tomb. Crucify him. Hosanna. Crucify him. Hosanna. Crucify him. Hosanna. Crucify him. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And now I invite our younger members to come forward, and Jennifer and Sarah. Yes, young, young at heart. Anyone who's just never sat up here and wants to, you're welcome. Good morning. You ready for my mind reading? Good morning, Grace. Good morning, Claire. Got it, didn't I? Good morning, Elijah and Liam and Wyatt. Skylar, Kendra, do you want to start with your song? I 
know for sure where the song Kumbaya came from. Historians think it is an African spiritual that started in southern USA. There's an old recording from 1926 where people are singing the English translation, Come By Here. In the 1960s, the song was all about living in harmony with each other. So it's over 100 years old, and we are still working on living in harmony. But this week being Holy Week, whether we sing, cry, or pray, possibly all the above, we ask God to come by here and be with us. Someone's crying, my Lord, kumbaya. Someone's crying, my Lord, kumbaya. Someone's crying, my Lord, kumbaya. Oh, Lord, kumbaya. Someone's praying, my Lord, kumbaya. Someone's praying, my Lord, kumbaya. Someone's praying, my Lord, kumbaya, oh Lord, kumbaya. Someone's singing, my Lord, kumbaya. Someone's singing, my Lord, kumbaya. Someone's singing, my Lord, kumbaya, oh Lord, kumbaya. Come by here, my Lord, come by here, come by here, my Lord, come by here, come by here, my Lord, come by here, oh Lord, come by here. Thank you, that was lovely. Well, I just wanted to take a minute because you all sent us with your blessing last week uh, to go on a little pilgrimage. There was only a couple of us that went, but we had a really, really nice time, I think. Liam, yes? Yeah, we did. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to share, we talked about some different points and uh, we, we talked about a quote in particular, and I was gonna share the quote with you so you can maybe think about it in your minds and what it means to you. Maybe Liam might, might remember what, it, what we decided it meant. Um, the quote is, faith is not the clinging to a shrine, but an endless pilgrimage of the heart. Do you remember, Liam? Is there anything that you wanna? is a place that you don't have to go to if you don't want. Oh, you're going to get me in trouble, Liam. Um, <laughs> yes. It was a little bit more than that. It was that it doesn't have to be church where we s celebrate our beliefs and our goodness. Right? All right. Okay. <laughs> don't want to send the wrong message there. So I think today we have palms. I'm going to ask my friends, can you put up your hand? I tried to, before church, hand out just one little single palm leaf. You can rip one of the thicker, bigger ones off the bottom, or if you want to put your hand up if you don't have one, my helper here, uh, Kendra, will come and bring you one. We are going to take a minute. I know how much you all love crafts. We're going to practice our uh, fine motor skills this morning our dexterity, and we're going to make this little tiny cross. Don't panic. I am available to help in coffee hour afterwards if you don't get through it. I also put a few on the offering table at the side here. If you have to go and can't come to coffee hour and yours didn't turn out, you can grab one of those. Does anybody want a little leaf that's already prepped here? Just put up your hand.
All right, it's simple, but I'm going to have to put the microphone down, so I'm going to do the best I can with you hearing me.
us come together in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, you have promised to be our God and have called us to be your covenant people. We want to be faithful. We want to follow the way you have shown us in Jesus. Yet we are easily led astray. Forgive us for going along with the crowd instead of standing for justice and peace. Forgive us for forgetting that we belong to you. Help us to remember and to walk in your way, following Jesus, our Savior and guide. The responsive song, Jim will play the refrain and the choir will sing it first. Let Israel now say, God's love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, God's love endures forever. Let those who fear God say, God's love endures forever. Open to me the gates of the temple, that I may enter and give thanks to God. This is the gate of God. Through it the righteous shall enter. I thank you, for you have answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is God's doing, marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, O God, we pray. God, we pray, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. We bless you from the house of God, our God, has given us light. With palm branches in hand, let us march to the altar. You are my God, and I will thank you. You are my God, and I will Reading from the Gospel of Mark.
When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that, that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked at everything, looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God. Amen. What a party. Palm branches and cloaks spread on the ground as Jesus entered Jerusalem. The crowd was shouting loud hosannas. It was a parade with excitement and anticipation. Jesus was riding into the city. Something big was happening. Our text in Mark begins this morning with when they approached Jerusalem. Who were they? In Luke's Gospel, 19, it tells us that Jesus entered Jericho on the way to Jerusalem and he met Zacchaeus. You remember the tax collector who climbed the tree? And Jesus came to him and said, I want to come to your house for supper tonight. And Zacchaeus had a change of heart and, and gave back to the, the community more than what he had collected as a tax collector. So we can assume that Zacchaeus was perhaps some of they who were following Jesus. Because we know that Jesus invited more than those who were high in stature. He did not, he, that he included more than the elite of society. Jesus invited the lost, the lowly, the unlikely, the blind, the lame, the mute, the weak, the poor, the sorrowful, the needy, all of these people were they who were with Jesus that day. And then he told two of the group of that people, two of his disciples, to go and fetch a colt. And he specified a colt that no one had ridden before. Why wouldn't any colt do? It is really a most unusual entry. Why didn't Jesus choose a stallion horse? We think about modes of transportation, and they tell us something about the person who owns it, who is driving. What do you think of when you see a van? You probably think about a family person driving, a mother or a father or a grandparent. What do you think about when you see someone driving a classic car? Or a sports car? Or a big truck? 
we speculate something about the driver. Jesus chose a colt, a lowly animal, a humble entry. There are only a few verses in Mark this morning that actually tell us about Jesus' entry into the city. The first seven verses tell us how Jesus in detail made the arrangements. Jesus had thought this through completely, had planned the entire occasion in advance. He arranged for the cult. He provided signals for the disciples to use if any people asked, why are you doing this? Why are you taking this cult? The, the disciples knew that they were simply to say, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here immediately. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing and the donkey's sacred mission was to carry Jesus. However, in this triumphal entry, Jesus chose to ride into the city on his colt, coming in peace. Possibly his feet dragging on the ground, not as one who holds authority over others, but as one who humbly rejects domination. He did not come with pomp and wealth, but as one identified with the poor, he did not come as mighty warrior, but as one who is vulnerable and refuses to rely on violence. Joseph chose, or Jesus chose an animal, the colt unridden, which is what a prince would choose to ride to signify peaceful intentions. Jesus was not coming to conquer, but to teach the ways of peace, riding a colt, a symbol of gentleness. The donkey was the perfect choice for Jesus. Just maybe it's a reminder on how we can live our faith for others to see and know. Not with sword or status or arrogance. Perhaps we can exemplify Jesus with humility and gentleness. We go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, who, where Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly at heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Jesus rode into Jerusalem. He entered the temple. He looked around at everything, and then he left. Kind of unusual. This is a highly charged entry into Jerusalem, the large shouting crowds, and after the parade, Jesus does nothing. He says nothing. He just leaves. Like, that's it? After all the fanfare with the greenery and the cloaks laid out for him to enter Jerusalem, he just leaves? It has been a day of anticipation, of excitement, with an unusual ending. There is no big dinner at the end of the day, no feast, no banquet, no speech, not even a meeting to signify the end. Jesus entered the Jerusalem, went into the temple, looked around at all things, and left. Imagine what the crowd would be thinking. They have been waiting for this for years. They've been singing the loud hosannas, which is one of the psalms, Psalm 118, we heard. They've been singing it, waiting. And this Palm Sunday, Jesus is actually coming into Jerusalem. It is a big deal. And then Jesus is leaving. The crowd was singing to their Messiah, Hosanna, the time had finally come. And he leaves. The disciples must have been thinking, what do you mean we're going home? Such an abrupt ending. 
It's all that was needed. The triumphal entry had served its purpose. So Jesus left with his disciples. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew how the week was going to proceed. Remember, he had told the disciples that his hour had come, that the time had come for him to meet his death, even though his soul was anguished. Holy Week is about to happen, and Holy Week is a scary week. Did Jesus just need to get away, have some prayer time, spend time with his beloved disciples, spend time with his friends in Bethany, Mary, and Martha? But we're told before he left, he entered the temple, he looked all around at everything. Mark's gospel is the only one to describe this. In Matthew, the whole city is in turmoil when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, but he goes into the temple and drives out those who are buying and selling. In John's gospel, Jesus does not even go into the temple. He entered the city and then began teaching. But today, in Mark's gospel, we're told that Jesus entered the temple, he looked at everything and left. The evening had come. But then we wonder, well, what about getting the colt back? Jesus had talked about returning the colt immediately, which is unique to this gospel also. Remember, Jesus had sent the two disciples to borrow the colt and told them if anyone asked what they were, why they were taking the colt, they were to say, the Lord needs it and will send it back immediately. Did Jesus and the twelve take the colt back after he left the temple, keeping his word before he entered Holy Week? What if returning the colt is a metaphor for us to return and release our stuff to God? Perhaps before we enter Holy Week, the stuff that we've carried for too long that weighs us down, that is baggage, that impoverishes life and purity of heart, perhaps we have to take that back, that we have to let it go, release it, and return it to God. We know what that stuff is grudge, resentment, disappointment, anger, and fear, because Lent is all about reflecting on ourselves of what we need to let go so that we can hear the resurrection story on Easter Sunday. Or maybe this week is the week to return about needing to be in control all the time, about having to be right, about needing approval. Maybe this week may be the time to retreat to a quiet place, to return and release all our stuff to God, making room for new life on Easter Sunday. Because Jesus looked into, went into the temple and he looked around at everything before he left. Looked around at all the things. It wasn't just a quick glance, but we are told that he took in everything that he saw. Are we to look around at everything that surrounds us and look at everything within us? Jesus knew who he was. He knew his earthly mission. He knew he would need his disciples with him on the way to the cross. He knew exactly why he had come to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, riding on that borrowed colt with his feet in the dust, his scruffy disciples alongside him. Palm Sunday. 
palm branches made into crosses that we put on our fridge or we use as a bookmark that will be a reminder this week of the connection between Palm Sunday celebration and next Friday's catastrophe. The palm branches that we saved last year, Steve has burned them into ashes for our next Ash Wednesday service. When we will receive the ashes on our foreheads and that dust to dust liturgy, our confession of all our mistakes, of us just being human, all that heart and soul work that we do, that we will receive forgiveness. So we have celebrated the palms. We have celebrated the parade. We have looked all around. Now our work is to look inside and look around this week. Because now we journey into Holy Week. Amen.
financial offerings and, and all that we give in energy and passion to serve this community and global work. Let us pray. Take these signs of our covenant with you, O God, our time, our talents, and our treasure, the way we use everything you have gifted to us in abundance, blessing it all to become blessings for the world. Let us pray. We pray to you, God, of palm branches and the cross, and give thanks that you understand us, and in your love have promised not to push away anyone who comes to you. We pray for people who feel pushed away from living a faith in Jesus by pressure from friends and family who do not share the same kind of ideas, ways, or clothes, for people who are pushed out by those who want power, whose main love is to be noticed, to have control. We pray for our church, that all those who trust in Jesus will be able, 
by your spirit to follow his humility, to see and imitate his servant life, to welcome and not to condemn. We pray for world leaders quick to stand in the limelight taking decisions which affect everyone in the world, but slow at times to do the steady, less glamorous work to which they are called. We pray for world leaders to understand their role to serve the peoples of the world, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and care for those who are weak. We pray for those who have recently lost those they have loved. And we especially pray for the family of Meredith Weep, the grief that they are holding in their hearts. And we pray for all those who will gather this afternoon to to meet and come together as a community to support one another in the grief. We take a moment of silent prayer as we pray for those in our community and in our families, for those who are grieving, let us pray. O oh God, hear our prayers and answer with love. And now we take a moment of silent prayer to, to give to God what is in our hearts. It could be thanksgiving for the blessings received in the last week, or it could be something that we need to give to God that is weighing upon our hearts and our minds. Let us pray. We give these prayers to you, God, trusting in the power of prayer. For all those that we've given you in our silent prayers, bless them with healing and comforting presence of your love and peace. We gather these in all our prayers, thankful that we may turn to you and pray as Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If life's a party, who cleans up? Look at all this. Palm branches all over the place. Someone even left their robe. It's looking a little worse for wear, I tell you. Oh well, I guess I can understand some forgetfulness. People were so excited. 
They really think this guy, Jesus, is the cat's meow. Really think he's going to turn things around. But against the Roman Empire, an army, is that really possible? I hear he caused a bit of ruckus at the temple after the parade, started yelling at the money changers and throwing stuff all around. I don't see that that's going to help him get the religious authorities on side. Hmm. Good luck, Jesus. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly anointment of nard, and she broke it op broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could, and she has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. If life's a party, who cleans up? This is the Passover meal. It's a celebration of deliverance, of freedom. It's a time to gather with family and recall the exodus, the grand adventure. But I've never heard so little laughter at a Passover before. You'd think that after this morning's delightful parade, they'd be in a celebratory mood. The voices from the other room were somber, sometimes anxious, bordering on argumentative, sometimes anxious, bordering on uh, uh, sorry, if they hadn't sung the traditional Passover hymn, I wouldn't have believed it to be the sacred meal. I know that it is. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, Are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, 
Are you sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So he came up, went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were abandoned? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. If life's a party, who cleans up? What a night this has been. 
a very unusual night of meetings. The whole Sanhedrin was here, the chief priests, the elders, the works. I've never seen them so dedicated to their job that they stayed up all night, so fervent in their faith. A trial? More like a kangaroo court or the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. What nonsense was said this night? One of Jesus' disciples tried to get close enough to hear without being obvious, hunkered around the fire in the courtyard. Ah, but it's hard to disguise a Galilean accent. That Peter guy slammed his cup down so hard it broke. I don't know him, he yelled. Then he was up and out of there before the rooster finished crowing. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt, then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say the by, to the bystanders, This man was one of them. But again he denied it. Then after a little while the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment... The cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. If life's a party, what kind of a party was this? Hell has partied today. Who cleans up this mess? How do we go from the parade of palms to the street littered with the stones thrown at the poor man, already so weak from a beating, he kept falling down? What happens to people anyway? Are we such herd animals that all we need is a little nudge, a little scandal, or suggestion of a scandal, and we tear people down? We human beings are capable of such beauty, such creativity, such courage and compassion. And yet, when we are frightened or disappointed or feel powerless, we are capable of such violence and unspeakable horror. Did the people that day fear the Romans and so destroyed the competing allegiance to God? Or did they fear Jesus and his radical call to peace through justice rather than power. Are we so afraid of justice? Are we so afraid of unconditional love?
we have gathered with the crowds crying, Hosanna. And now we follow the crowd as it leads out to the cross. And yet even as the world grows dark, we cannot lose hope. Because God is with us. God will be with us. Whatever happens, we are not alone. Go with the blessings of God, the love of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit upon you. Amen.